Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Triple Play, that podcast where we blame everyone but ourselves for our mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> because this month, I suppose, or in the past month, we read Jurassic Park, the novel the, the movie was based on. Written by Michael Crichton. It was published in November of 1990, a full three years before the movie came out. Yeah, well, almost three years. Um... Right, and not many people, I think, actually know that Jurassic Park was based on a book. Yeah, I mean, when I first heard that, I was like, wait, what? Jurassic <laughs> Park was based on a book? I just, someone saw me reading it this week and was like, wait, what? Jurassic Park is based on a book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think people, most people think it's an original movie franchise, and, you know, the book isn't exactly as... Uh, well known as it should be because I think we both enjoyed it. Well, yeah. M- well, I definitely thought it was better, th- you know, than the the adaptation. I think they're both good in their own right. I think in their own mediums, they're both really good. Right. Cause well, because I, I feel like cross comparing mediums is not usually an apt comparison. But we'll talk about that in a bit. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I I think the way we're going to uh do this which i mean if you can't tell we're deciding this now we're going to talk about i guess the difference we're not going to explain the entire plot of the book because it's pretty long yeah, it's and longer detailed. than the movie yeah um but we're just going to explain the differences between the movie and the book and you know mm-hmm. kind of go through the plot in that way yeah i suppose and uh i guess then we're just going to end on you know what we thought of it and maybe yeah. how it worked as an adaptation or how the movie worked as an adaptation of this book yeah um all of these point five episodes are going to be pretty experimental because they're all going to be covering vastly different topics yeah so so yeah i guess we just jump into it i suppose yeah well we'll start by saying we read the 25th anniversary edition which obviously came out this year since it was first published in 1990 and yeah now it's 2015 but yeah i mean this 25th anniversary edition you think it would have some extras or something but no it's just a no frills reprint of the book i mean the cover looks pretty cool yeah, it's the original cover art, actually. Yeah. Which is good, because I actually really hate movie tie-in cover art. Because <laughs> I always think it's worse than the original cover art. Like, for example, you know, The Martian is getting a movie adaptation, which actually is coming out really recently, compared to when we we're releasing and recording this. <laughs> but uh, they, The Martian was published pretty recently with some pretty cool cover art, and then I guess when the movie came out, they decided to republish it with way worse cover art that's just a picture of Matt Damon in an astronaut suit. <laughs> you know? Is it just a movie poster? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so it's, it's not even that good of a movie poster. Yeah, it's one of the lesser ones for this year, I think. We've had some pretty good movie posters. <clears throat> and good movies, actually. 2015's been a pretty good year for movies, surprisingly. <laughs> I don't think I've seen any... 2015 released movies at all. Wow, that's actually <laughs> impressive, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, that's not what we're here to discuss. <laughs> right, we're here to discuss the book, which, like we said, has the original cover at 25th anniversary edition. It begins, I believe, with a short prologue. Right, it begins, I mean, the movie begins with, you know, they're sort of transporting dinosaurs and things sort of go a little bit wrong and... You know, it begins with that scene, I I guess, sort of raining or windy or whatever, and you can't exactly tell what's going on. Um, Mm -hmm. The book begins, I guess, with something similar to that. Um, Well, it begins with the it begins with a really, really short prelude, prologue, note, whatever, kind of explaining the history of genetics. Right. Yeah. In in universe. Yeah. Talking about how there was companies and then they found and they patented genetic technology and whatever. Guess to get you in get you in the mindset of what you're about to read. And then it begins, yeah, sort of like that, but it actually begins with the scene um, that they used for the opening of Jurassic Park 2 with the girl, the family, they're on a beach, and the girl gets yeah. attacked. Well, I mean, it begins with the doctor um, yeah. and, uh, you know, treating the guy who got scraped up by the raptor. But, uh, yeah, no, it begins with material from that they use in the second one. Um, yeah, and like we said in our trilogy episode, a lot of the things you did in the later movies were pulled from this this, book this book because they couldn't get all of it into the first movie it is a really long book yeah um yeah (laughs) i guess we'll talk um 
more to that and how it works and then as an adaptation but um mm-hmm. yeah you know then it, things proceed kind of how they do in the movie a little bit more detailed with more backstory as to who the characters are yeah which would pretty much always be the case with a, a movie based on a book yeah you know grant and ellie and everyone else you know they wind up at the island and everything i guess with the exception <laughs> of the hobbit where they took one book and turned it into three movies <laughs> which i think about is sort of what they did here but anyway um, yeah, not 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 as much, not in the same way. But, yeah, um, right. So everybody gets to the island with Malcolm and Gennaro, who actually didn't know his name in the movie. To be honest, yeah, no, I didn't either. <laughs> um, I think we mentioned in the the previous episode for Jurassic Park that we didn't really know the characters' names. Um, yeah, I think that was one of our chief complaints about the movie. Actually, was <clears throat> that we never knew anybody's name except Grant and Malcolm, Malcolm and Sally. Ellie and. Hammond. And Tim. Well, I mean, Tim and Lex were way less prominent in the movie and way worse in the movie. Um, well, Lex was worse in the book, in my opinion. She's kind of a spoiled yeah. brat, to be honest. <laughs> Tim was awesome, though. Yeah. Um, well, well, I guess we this is a good, the... good segue into character differences, I guess. Yeah. So that, what Which I was about to say. I guess you were about to say, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, so, well, no, no worries. <laughs> so, characters like Grant, Ellie, and... Um, most of the Jurassic Park staff, I guess, are pretty much the same, just a little bit more detailed. Yeah, well, the most noticeable difference among that group is that Grant basically looks nothing like he does in the movie, <laughs> because in the book he has shorts, he has khaki shorts, a Hawaiian shirt, and a beard. Yeah. He has none of those in the movie. I don't, well, even think, though they gave character descriptions in the book, I just imagined everyone is how they looked in the movie. I couldn't not do that. I tried to, but... It's pretty much what I did, except for Grant, because, like, he has a beard. Gotta imagine... With a beard! <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah pretty I much everyone was the same as in the movie to me. <clears throat> which is... An interesting topic of discussion it's, about... It's, how you can never... If you see the movie first, you're kind of set into seeing the characters that way. Kind of set in one interpretation of the description of the characters. Yeah, I suppose. Um... The only one who was different to me was Lex, because they in the movie they actually switched around Tim and Lex. Yeah. Their, well, their ages at least, and you know in the movie, I think Lex was the one who was more interested in computers and science and stuff, and then in the book yeah. Tim is. So. Right. Yeah. Um, so they get car- to well, the park. Yeah, I mean... Um, the reveal of the park Woo, was different than the movie. Woo is way more prominent in the, <laughs> in the um, book. Way more of an interesting character in the book, of course. And Muldoon is yeah, a lot more important, too. Mm-hmm. Actually, all the characters in the book are pretty important to the plot. There isn't really one character on the on the island, at least, because the, the Doctor in the beginning and the people on the mainland aren't really that important. Right. But there isn't someone on the island who's named who isn't important. Unlike in the movie, where <laughs> Doctor Who shows up for a minute, he says something about an egg hatching, and then leads him through <laughs> that. Um, well, we should also probably mention that one, Ian Malcolm is a lot more snarky and enjoyable in the book. Uh, and Hammond is a lot more stubborn and more of a terrible person in the book. Yeah. And speaking of imagining characters, I actually think Jeff Goldblum was actually a perfect casting choice for Malcolm based on his description of the book. Like, out of all the ones in the book who were in the movie, I found it easiest to just imagine Malcolm as Jeff Goldblum in the movie. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, because they nailed the, he wears all black with the black shades and he's kind of always in the background kind of talking. So <laughs> now he's sitting here by himself talking to himself. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that is probably the best costing the movie did out of, out of all of them. So props to them for doing that. <clears throat> Great. But yeah, so, so moving on from that, I guess they get to the park and one of the major differences I noticed from the movie was the fact that the park reveal was a lot different than in the movie because in the movie there's you know they get in the car and they go through the gate and then there's the brontosaurus or whatever the apatosaurus or whatever the technical <laughs> name is and then Grant's like oh dinosaurs and in the book they kind of land on a helicopter on a helipad and then they see some dinosaurs while they're driving to the visitor center and Grant's like what have you done <laughs> <clears throat> um yeah i think in the book grant is slightly less amazed but and, you know, slightly more concerned that Hammond just brought back dinosaurs, but... 
Because Hammond, Hammond's a lot more of that eccentric millionaire, billionaire, I guess, <laughs> in the book than he is in the movie. Yeah, and I do remember reading that they almost wanted to Walt Disneyfy him in the movie, and they kind of did. Yeah, because I think they didn't want him to be such a hateable character like he is in the book. <laughs> yeah, but he was such a... I mean, you know, you, you love, love to, to hate, hate him, him in the book. <laughs> and then he gets his... He's just desserts. Yeah. So... Things proceed pretty much how they do in the movie with a lot more detail. Exp- yeah, a lot more detail and a lot less. Watch this video <laughs> explaining what's going on. A lot more Hammond in the background being snarky to, to Malcolm. Yeah. Because they're sitting in in the movie. There's the scene where they're sitting in the little theater and they have the, I guess the the John Hammond in the in the film, and then in in the book, what's happening is they're sitting in that theater, but Hammond's sitting in the back, and Malcolm's like, "Yeah, this is all gonna go wrong." <laughs> And Hammond's like, no, it won't. No, it won't. It'll <laughs> succeed. Yeah, more so than in the movie, uh, Malcolm just spends the entire book telling everyone, I told you this was all just going to fall apart. And <laughs> it's some of the best parts of the book are him just telling everyone that, yeah, I told you guys this was going to go all yeah, well, terribly wrong. <laughs> well, like, it was super satisfying that everybody'd be like, yep, I predicted this. And Arnold, would, Arnold, who also had a way bigger part in the book than he did in the movie, would be like, no, you didn't. We've got the part completely under control. And then Malcolm like, do you? Do you? <laughs> and then they find out they've been running on auxiliary power for the past 20 hours. <laughs> uh. But yeah, they head off into the park. Things proceed pretty much how they do in the movie for the most part. Yeah, <clears throat> pretty much. Uh, you know, they see all the dinosaurs and then the storm starts. Dennis Nedry has shown up, has met with his contact He's getting yeah, the money. It's not a Barbasol can, though. It's a Gillette shade cream <laughs> can. Yeah, Nedry's plot line, I think, was pretty much exactly the same in, in the movie, other than his death. His death well, was the same. It was but killed only, by the same dinosaur. Well, there was only one dinosaur in the in the movie, but it was multiple ones in the book. Okay, well, I mean, that's a really minor difference, <laughs> but to be honest. But it's still a difference. <laughs> it's like the most minor difference in the whole novel <laughs> compared to the movie. <laughs> but it's still a difference. <laughs> anyway, so everything obviously goes wrong. I mean, you've seen the movie, you've heard us talk about the movie, everything goes wrong, the power goes out, the T-Rex busts out. Knocks him around a bit. Like we met, uh, we didn't mention actually the scene where Hammond reveals that he's brought his grandkids to the island and Gennaro's like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, they have a yelling fight. And there's a scene where Tim and Lex are kind of looking all like, what are they yelling about? Hammond also says in the, in the book, and he doesn't say this in the movie, that he only brought Tim and Lex to the island to show investors that it was fun and safe for children. That yeah. turned out well. Yeah, for multiple reasons that turned out well. And um, in the movie, it seemed more like he actually cared for Le- Tim and Lex. Yeah. In the book, that's not the case at all. <laughs> um, There's more background given on their parents, too. Tim and Lex's parents are getting a divorce, apparently, and Lex likes their dad more than Tim does because t- their dad thinks Tim, I guess, is a is, nerd. Yeah, no, I don't for know. liking dinosaurs. So Tim <laughs> likes, his, likes his mom's boyfriend more than... The dad. So, yeah. So that's some interesting, interesting. Yeah, th- I mean, I thought that cool conversation between Tim and Grant was pretty interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I think, well, after the T-Rex attack, like in the movie, Grant, Tim, and Lex sort of journey across the island in a lot more detail and with a lot more suspense, actually, than in the movie. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I really liked about the book was that even more so than the movie delivered a, like a sense of suspense, I guess, mm-hmm. um, you know, with them being just feet away from the T-Rex and it's sleeping and they have to get around it and everything like that. Right. And there was more, I guess, character, maybe not development, but background story with Grant and Tim and Lex. Mm -hmm. And Tim is awesome in the book. Yeah, because Lex is a spoiled brat because her dad loves her (laughs) and gives her everything and doesn't give anything to Tim. (laughs) And um, And Lex just likes to throw it in Tim's face (laughs) and it's just like, wow, Lex, really? (laughs) Grant could just chuck you out of this boat right now and you'd be dead. Well, wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> She's like half the reason why they almost get killed every time. Yeah, at least Tim was pretty likable. Tim is almost, I mean, next to Grant, I'd say, I know before we were saying like, yeah, it's pretty much an ensemble cast, but mm-hmm. 
I'd say if if we're gonna say anyone's a main character, yeah, obviously it's Grant. But even Tim was, you know, I think he was up there in with in main character status with Grant in the book. So yeah, so Tim is a much more major character in the novel than he is in the film. So and, like yeah, like other characters, I guess. <laughs> I guess <laughs> like we were saying, um, so they're going, you know, T Rex attacks. Malcolm gets. St- bitten his leg gets bitten which doesn't happen in the movie right malcolm kind of disappears for 100 pages he spends the entire rest of the book almost dead in a delirium state he's kind of ranting about how everything's going wrong and how he knew it was coming (laughs) yep so things you know take a turn for the different here i guess um not much not much the pterodactyl scene from the third movie is in this book yeah, as is the floating down the river in a raft scene, which I believe they also used in the third movie. Yeah, with the different dinosaurs, obviously the Spinosaurus, I think it was. Yeah. Um, which isn't in the book at all. The book also goes into a lot more detail about everything that goes wrong in the park and just all the terrible ideas that went into um, creating the park more so than the movie does. Yeah, like how... Um, their, their computer system was designed to search for a certain amount of animals... But it always assumed there was the correct amount of animals, so if you put in a different number, then it would actually find all the animals on the island. Well, I think they built it um, assuming that there would never be any more animals, because, you know, obviously they can't breed. So they designed it around making sure there were no missing animals instead of tracking the actual number of animals. Yeah, so the computer system is a piece of junk designed by Nedry, I guess. (laughs) Mentions is like a list of a hundred bugs that Nedry needs to fix, and he's like, whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, he's about to get rich super quickly anyway, so he doesn't care. He pro- yeah. he also designed all the back doors that he uses to, uh, you know, shut everything down. And yeah, probably wasn't the best idea to trust one programmer with your entire park. <laughs> you know, whether that be the movie or the book. <clears throat> Well, Arnold and Wu seem to know what they're doing, but then again, they didn't really design anything. So. Yeah, well, see, Arnold and Wu knew about the computers enough to be able to run it, but they couldn't program it, and that all goes to <laughs> part in a bit. But Muldoon also at one point started thinking ahead and put some, I guess, a giant tranquilizer needle launcher into the one Jeep that Nedry ends up stealing, and then when the T-Rex gets out, Muldoon's like, good thing I planned ahead. Oh, <laughs> bollocks, where's the Jeep? <clears throat> right, and now since you said that, it might be... Now might be an opportune time to mention that in the book, Oh Balls is like Hammond's catchphrase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, he's always like, it'll be fine. We're going to get it back under control. The park accounted for this. We all accounted for this. And then Malcolm's like, yeah, it doesn't matter if you accounted for it because my model accounted for the fact that you accounted for it and told you it was all going to go wrong. Yeah, pretty much, except Hammond does so in a much less calm way. Pretty much just yells at everyone about how they're all ruining everything for the entire book. Yeah, and spends his last couple pages in the novel ranting about how it's everybody else's fault except his <laughs> own. The park failed. And he would do it better next time. He wouldn't hire Arnold because Arnold was a hack. He wouldn't hire Wu because Wu <laughs> was just a young student who didn't know anything. He wouldn't hire Malcolm because he just plotted to bring it down from the beginning and Muldoon was a hack hunter. And- <laughs> Grant wasn't a real paleontologist or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, so, you know, they get back to the compound like they do in the movie. and Yeah, I don't know what you expected. In a lot more detail. I mean, the main difference is just chalk up to the book being way more detailed. Yeah. And better because of that. Um, Or more enjoyable, in my opinion, because of that. Mm Mm-hmm. And it ends with... It ends differently than the movie. It ends differently. It ends a lot differently, actually. Yeah, the movie, pretty much as soon as they get back to the visitor center, they hop on a helicopter and leave. But (laughs) the novel, they get back to the visitor center and they spend a whole bunch of time putting the power back on. And when they get it back on, uh, Grant and Sattler are like, we need to go count all the velociraptor eggs we can find because that way we can account for all the dinosaurs in the island because some of them probably weren't picked up by the computer because there's dinosaurs on the mainland somehow. Yeah. Um, there was also, I think, the subplot in the book with the um, the ship getting to the mainland and it had dinosaurs on it, and they needed to stop it. And Yeah, they might have adapted that as the end of Jurassic Park 2. 
the last world where the, uh, yeah, the, the last mean, raptors get back and then they rampage or the t-rex gets back yeah. and rampages through san diego maybe maybe that was an adaptation of this uh, or maybe they got the idea from this but yeah they end the book in a lo- much smarter note you know they go and account for the velociraptors and then there's the interesting um you know part of the book where right at the end the velociraptors want to migrate because you know dinosaurs evolved from birds you know according to what you we know birds but, evolved from dinosaurs yeah the other way around <laughs> <clears throat> yeah birds evolved from dinosaurs so pretty interesting you know the velociraptors all head off to a corner of the island and Grant's like, wow, they want to migrate. I thought that part was really cool. I liked that. Yeah, and then Hammond wants to go through to his uh, bungalow, I guess, and the kids are messing around with the computer system and play a T-Rex over the loudspeaker, <laughs> and Hammond's like, oh, shoot, falls down a hill and breaks his ankle and then ends up getting eaten by dinosaurs. Pretty much in the same way as Nedry. Yeah, different dinosaur, though. <clears throat> uh, pretty gruesome death, but he had it coming. <laughs> um, Ian Malcolm also dies. And then is apparently revived in the second book. Somehow. Maybe they use their dinosaur cloning technologies to clone Malcolm. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure Michael Crichton just makes up some BS reason as to why he's back. Well, the only indication that Malcolm dies in the book is the fact that when Grant asks the only thing that's close to a vet on the island what happened to Malcolm, he just kind of shakes his head, implying that he's dead. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were they um or Crichton's intention was that he was dead. <laughs> Pretty sure. And then when he turned out to be such a popular character and, you know, Crichton liked him, he decided to just bring him back. Yeah, well, The Lost World is the only sequel Crichton ever wrote. Yeah, the third one obviously isn't really based on a book, but takes some things from Scenes ripped from the other two books. Yeah. Right, and also they carpet bomb the island, which I mentioned in the episode (laughs) that I wanted them to do. They did it in the movie, but they did in the book, so thank you. (laughs) And that's pretty much how it ends. It actually ends on a lot more ominous note where they get back to the Costa Rica and they're at the em- the embassy won't let them go back to America because the Costa Rican government wants to know what's up with the dinosaurs. So they're set Grant up at a hotel and someone comes over, asks about the dinosaurs, indicates that there's velociraptors migrating through the mainland. And then he's like, oh yeah, we're never leaving. And then it ends. <laughs> yep. Then dinosaurs evolved and took over the world and killed all the humans. Yeah, I'm sure that's what the next book is about. <laughs> um, now they go to Isla Sorna in the next book. Remember the facility where they bred the dinosaurs and raised them and they transported them from Isla Sorna to Isla Nublar. Well, we'll have to read the next book to find out exactly what happens in the next book, obviously. And I think I'll just take now to um, say that I thought Costa Rica was an island. Apparently, I just don't know about geography or at all. Because, yeah, I thought it was an island, but apparently it's not. So, there you go. Yeah, apparently, it's, it's south of Guatemala, which is south of Mexico, which is south of where we are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. The book also implies, or Hammond says, that he's got he's going to be making Jurassic Park Japan and Jurassic Park Europe in the coming years. Because, you know, that's a good idea, too. <laughs> he's got an island that he's bought off the coast of Japan, and he has a tract of land in Europe. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure not putting it on an island would be a great idea. <laughs> so, yeah. See, so, yeah, I really enjoyed this book a lot more than the movie. And, you know, if you listen to our other episode on this, you know, I wasn't even a fan of the first movie very much. I thought it was good, but not great. Uh, but I really th- enjoyed this book, and I do think the book was great. The book is good. It's uh, it's a really good sci-fi novel, to be honest. Yeah, one thing I really enjoyed, I think you probably like this too, and I'm pretty sure most readers of this book like this, is that Michael Crichton, I guess, knows a lot about science. I don't know how much he made up or and how much was actually real, but he seems to know a lot. Mm-hmm. But... He usually explains it in ways that you would understand, um, or he has his characters yeah. explain it in ways that you'd understand, you know, making analogies or just thoroughly explaining things. So it's, you didn't really ever feel lost, even if you didn't know a lot about, like, programming or, like, genetic engineering. Like, obviously, I don't, so... But I didn't feel lost at all while reading this, and they offered sufficient explanation as to, you know, the different science the things that they did in the book. The sciencey things. Yeah, most of Michael Crichton's books are science fiction, I believe. So he kind of does that for a living, I suppose. Which yeah. is what he did for a living. 
Um, well, I mean, he's written like 20 books, so. <laughs> yeah, and a whole bunch of them got turned into movies, <laughs> which is why Steven Spielberg picked this one up before it was even published, <laughs> which was smart, I guess. Yeah. Spawned a good franchise. Um, yeah, I like uh, when they were talking about the computer, they weren't just explain. He didn't just explain the computer screen. They had actual printout slash pictures of what the screen would have looked like. Right, lots uh, of in diagrams in this book. Lots of diagrams. Lots of fractal images. <laughs> the book is split up into seven, six. Seven iterations, I think. I thought it was six. Oh, we have the book right here. We can find out. Um... Seventh. Yeah. Seven. <clears throat> seven iterations of a fractal, I guess. Each each iteration begins with a quote from Ian Malcolm <laughs> and a picture of the fractal. And as the iterations go on, the fractal gets more and more complex. But it always looks the same, which is kind of the point that I guess Malcolm was trying to make for the whole novel with chaos theory that regardless of how big a system is, you can reduce it down to a smaller one and be- predict, you know, what it's going to do. Yeah. Um, that is actually my one complaint about the book is that those quotes from Ian Malcolm had nothing to do with the novel unless I guess you really read it deeply and the quotes maybe have something to do with how badly everything's going but to be honest they felt pretty out of place and I it's the one thing I didn't like about the book was those Ian Malcolm quotes on the iteration pages yeah it's a small complaint but it's one I had too I mean it didn't really need to be split up into seven parts when each part didn't really feel distinct from each other, except maybe, like, the first and second. Yeah, all the parts just kind of ran into each other. Yeah. Um, also, there were, like, nine chapters called Control. Yeah, but the <laughs> chapters seem to be pretty haphazardly named. They are either named after the location it was set or after the main character of, of the chapter. So there was chapters named Hammond, where Hammond was just ranting to himself about how it's anybody <laughs> else's fault. And there was chapters named Control, where it's set it predominantly in the control room. And then pretty much any chapter that's not either predominantly set in one location or doesn't predominantly follow one character has an interesting name. Uh, but those are the only chapters with unique names. Right. There's. I'm just flipping through the book now. There's one's called The Tour. Obviously, that's The Tour. There's When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. Uh, you know, goes on for about two pages. Um. <laughs> two pages. Whoa. <laughs> but yeah, not not much... In way of complaints, you know, on my part, I enjoyed the book. Yeah, more more it was so enjoyable. Than the movie. It was easy to read, I suppose. Pretty alluring, I guess is the word. You know, I always wanted to go back and read it, even when I was busy doing something else. Yeah, I mean, it was. It wasn't hard. I didn't have to push myself through this. You know, I usually don't have to push myself through books since I enjoy reading, but. Mm-hmm. You know, I read 300 pages of this in a week when I was, like, super busy anyway, so there you go. <laughs> right. Well, the movie also works as a pretty good adaptation. I mean, obviously, they had to cut out chunks of the novel because if they adapted this novel straight into a movie, you'd end up with a four-hour movie at, at least. Yeah. I guess. I mean, that's but that's also my... Biggest complaint is that they didn't adapt it very well, and the book isn't really suited to a movie adaptation. Really? I thought it was perfectly suited for a movie adaptation. Well, it's more suited to like a series, like a TV series, if they don't want to, if they didn't want to change a bunch of stuff and cut things out. I, Ultimate, that ultimately made the movie worse, in my opinion, than the book. I think the movie works as an adaptation. All the scenes that were in the movie were the major beats of the plot of the novel. It wasn't like any of the scenes that they cut out were thrillingly major points of the plot, you know, it's not like you're going to miss the fact that there's some people on the mainland getting bit by dinosaurs when that kind of plot thread was dropped from the movie. Yeah, of course, but the movie has a lot less characterization. The well, that's just, a, that. that's just a limit of the art form. That's just a limit of movies in general that you can't really get as much characterization in. Yeah, that's but... why you probably think it's better as a TV show, because in a TV show they have a, an entire season to develop characters. Yeah, but that it detracts from the movie, in my opinion. And after reading this, I see that now. Yeah, I disagree with that. I mean, like I said at the beginning, I think cross-comparing mediums is kind of useless, to be honest, because each medium has its strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, but one's an adaptation of the other. You can't not compare them. I mean, you can compare them in terms of adaptation-wise, but as their own kind of stories, you can't really compare them. I mean, 
like Harry Potter kind of spawned its own global phenomenon because it became a movie and not because of the book series. Like predominantly the movies are to thank for Harry Potter getting huge. Well, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I don't know too much about Harry Potter, but pretty sure the books were pretty huge before the movies. Well, I think only the first three novels were complete or the first four were complete by the time they started making the movies. Yeah, I'm pretty sure those were pretty big. I don't know, though. I mean, I'm not a Harry I'm Potter fan. I'm fairly certain the movies are the reason why it got big, because people saw the movie first, and then they read the book. <clears throat> Maybe in the U.S. I don't know. But, yeah, this is about Jurassic Park, so... Um, yeah, I just I just think the book is a... Is, if you want to... If you're deciding, like, oh, should I watch the Jurassic Park movie or read the book, and you for some reason can't do both even though the movie's only two hours then i'd say definitely go with the book i guess but it's like the movie was designed for people who don't have two weeks to get through the novel i mean that's you know another reason why the adaptation well, is good no, because I'm... it gives people more it gives a wider audience the ability to read the book well, i don't think they made the movie with you know the idea in mind that like okay this is going to be for people who are too busy to read the book i think it's just made for moviegoers <laughs> True, but that's a, a side effect of making the movie was the fact that it opened it up to a wider audience who couldn't or didn't have the time to read the book. You know, people working nine to five jobs every day won't have time to sit down and read a book, you know, for a 420 page novel yeah. for or people, three weeks. Or people who hate reading, which is pretty much everyone. <laughs> or English language learners, people who, who English isn't their first language, it would be easier to watch the movie than it would be to read the book. Yeah, well, you probably just watch the book or read the watch movie. Watch the book. <laughs> Yeah, you probably just read the book or watch the movie in your native language if that was the case. <laughs> Pretty sure this has been translated into Well, the book's been languages. translated, but the movie hasn't, I suppose. Well, it's probably been subtitled or even yeah, I kind of hate subtitles to be honest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's really difficult for me to watch a movie when subtitles are on cuz I always want to read the subtitles but then I miss what's going on on the screen. Just, just look at the whole thing at once. And then how do you read the subtitles? You read it in your peripheral vision. I don't know. Anyway. Exactly my point. <laughs> anyway, I suggest the book. I, I think the book is superior to the movie. I think both are superior, <laughs> both are su- to, superior to, uh, each to other. Uh, to other things within <laughs> the genre. The movie is superior to most other dinosaur movies. The book is superior to most novels. Well, I mean, I wasn't a exactly a huge fan of the first movie in the first place so whatever <laughs> yeah like that would bias you <clears throat> do you know jaws you was based a on a novel no I mean, now do i know. do <laughs> it's probably worse than the movie i'm, yeah, I'm it was, assuming it was apparently super pulpy isn't also the movie i guess <laughs> anyway. I, haven't, I haven't actually seen jaws yeah me neither I guess we're probably going to watch that for this podcast, though, but... Yeah, eventually. I mean, they do have 19 of them, so... I mean, in the Back to the Future <laughs> timeline, yeah. Which is obviously the timeline we're recording this in. Right. And we're sending it to that other timeline that's listening to it. But anyway... Um, yeah, one, have... there is one thing I want to say about the book, which is what I noticed is that there's a surprising amount of things in Jurassic World that were actually taken from the book that didn't appear in the first three films. Hmm. Like the divorce, the parents getting divorced subplot, which didn't appear in any of the first three movies, actually does make an appearance in Jurassic World. There's a couple other minor things. Doctor Wu's a major character in Jurassic World. <laughs> yeah, see, maybe they adapted ideas from this book better in Jurassic World if they kept some of that characterization. Even if Doctor Wu's different. <laughs> Yeah, the kids in Jurassic World weren't much likable, much more likable than Jurassic Park, so... I mean, I, when I came out of Jurassic World, I know I texted you, like, it has all the makings of a Jurassic Park film. Unlikable characters, <laughs> dumb decisions, and decrepit buildings. Well, at least all three of those were original ideas from the book. That's a bit of a misnomer. Original ideas from the book... What do you mean? They're not original to the movie anymore. Well, I mean, they were originally book. taken from the book. That's what I meant. Okay. You know, the unlikable characters, yeah. terrible ideas, decrepit buildings are all from the book. So at least they adapted those three things well. <laughs> <sighs> well, I guess that's all we have to say on this book. <clears throat> right. Um, this novel. Pick it up if you want. Pretty good read. 
uh, 10 bucks ish for the new reprint that came out this year. Worth it, I would say. You'd probably get it used or on sale for cheaper than that. So <laughs> Most books are worth it at 10 bucks. <laughs> It's 10 bucks a pretty good price, actually. Uh, so email us at the thedoctordickatedvegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, questions about Jurassic Park and or fan fiction, which I imagine does exist, probably. Uh, check us out on YouTube at Triple Play. Check us out uh, on iTunes at Triple Play. Leave a rating if you like the show. Find the feed on the website for Triple Play. Your buddies are on Android. They're like, I don't have iTunes. You're like, bam! <laughs> Here's a feed <laughs> that you can use. <clears throat> yeah. Check us out on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash 3P podcast. You know, follow us on Facebook. Check us out on Twitter at 3P podcast and uh, follow us on Twitter also. And um, yeah, we'll have a new episode out a in a month now. yeah on a on, a, on, a, on another trilogy <laughs> but yeah until then the end